Amen. Well, this morning we have with us Evangelist Rick Stolzer. He's been with us since Thursday night. Preached a number of uh, good messages that we've been through for this morning's uh, small group was uh, excellent in asking questions, uh, which was a blessing and a help. So without further ado, Brother Tozer, would you come on out and preach the word? Amen. Thank you. Amen. Good morning. I'm glad you're in the Lord's house. So I was thinking last night I started writing in my journal and I said, man, I have enjoyed being at this church. These people are so receptive. There is an energy in this body, believers. Amen. What a blessing. Keep up the good work. And so grateful. Yesterday we had a good number of people from outreach time, soul winning time. And not only did people show up, they showed up with a joyful spirit, evidenced by the fact that they stayed around and set up in the tent for the meal afterwards. So they not only took the food to the spiritually hungry, they got set up so you'll have a good meal here in a few minutes. I saw some of the food coming in today. We're in for a good time. So my job is to carve up the spiritual food, and then we'll get to the other pretty soon. All right, would you open up to Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3 this morning. Thank you, Pastor, for all your kindness to me, and uh, I, I really do appreciate it. I mean, he's, he got called out in the middle of the night the other night for uh, uh, a death, he's a chaplain, you know, and, and he's, he's been burning the candle at both ends. And I appreciate the joyful way your pastor approaches serving you and serving the Lord. And I hope you'll let him and Betty know how much you appreciate it and what they do. I've got to say, I have been pleasantly surprised at your kindness to me. You, you knew I grew up in Boston County. I lived in the town of Sewell. I moved out to Kansas City in uh, 1993, and I've lived in Kansas City, Missouri since then. But when I come home, I quickly lapse back into my Delaware Valley roots. And, you know, the Bible says a prophet is not without honor, saving his own country. In other words, you usually don't get respect at home, but what? You've been really kind to me. Thank you for that. I'm grateful. All right, Acts chapter 3. Have you ever known somebody whose life was radically changed by the gospel? I mean, maybe you knew them before they were saved, and then after they came to Christ, total change. How many of you knew somebody like that? Yeah, how many of you are thinking of your own life? Yeah. One of the people who's been most impactful in my life was a coach that I had at Gloucester County Christian School. Amen. Many of you know him, Holly Ham. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Ham now lives in South Carolina. We've remained very close friends. And I remember I went to Gloucester County Christian in 1981. That was my first year in the school there. And Holly was in his first year teaching, uh, coaching. And I remember he had this, this dynamic way about it. He, he'd get up and sing. He's got a gifted voice. And he would just clutch the songbook. And he would sing like he was talking to God. Amen. Which he was. Amen. And there was this enthusiasm. He was also funny. We were laughing all the time, I remember. And one day I said to him as I was getting to know him, Coach, what did you do before you were a Christian school teacher? He said, ah, the old life. I said, yeah. He said, well, let's just say that was before Christ. I said, no, really, Mr. Henry, what did you do? He said, well, I was in the entertainment business. I said, you mean like Hollywood? He said, mm, no nightclubs. I said, oh, really? He had grown up in New England. He lived in New Hampshire, Maine, and Madison along the way, and then he moved to South Jersey. He said, yeah, when I was up in New England, he said, we still to Long Island, and we would do nightclub. And I had a partner, and he said, it'd be, you know, a comedy and music routine. And I said, man, I'd imagine that there was probably a lot of drinking involved in that. And he said, well, for the people in the bars there, because, you know, that's what they came. He said, I would have drank before the performance. He said, and really, alcohol wasn't my thing, but he said, back then, it was drugs. And he said, you know, we'd shoot up or whatever afterward. And then, uh, he said, then we moved to South Jersey. And he said, um, I got a partner down here. Oh, this was funny. Uh, the partner's last name was Kraft. And my coach's name was Ham. So they called their act Ham and Cheese. That was the name of the comedy or two. And he said, we'd be in that close and all. He said, then one day, a guy knocked on my door from the Baptist church, inviting us to church. And he said, Sharon and I eventually went to church, and he said, we got saved. Amen. And everything changed. He said, I didn't have a desire for the old life. And in fact, I, I remember one day, I'd, I'd come back here, and I was preaching at the Christian school. And Mr. Ham and I went out to play golf. We went to Riverwinds along the river there. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, and I know Pastor Jones Air Force was with us, too. And all of a sudden, this guy comes driving back toward us like a maniac, like Jay, you know, driving furiously. And he's coming back toward us. He goes, Hey, you guys want to see a nine iron back there? And 
Mr. Ram says, oh yeah, we picked it up. He said, Danny, Danny Kraft was his old partner. Wow. Yeah. And he said, oh, holy, you blankety blank. And he started going off on a high rate of profanity. And, all, and, and at one point he used the Lord's name in vain. Mm-hmm. Paul said, yeah, I asked you above mm-hmm. everything that you wouldn't use my Savior's name like that. Oh yeah, holy, thanks for finding my nine iron, dude. He said, I forgot your holy roller now. Good seeing you. I'm going off. These two had partners, made money together, night after night. But what a difference. Amen. Yeah. Right. One man was a new creature in Christ, and the other was still in the old life. Right. We're going to look at a guy in the Bible today whose life was radically changed by God. Interestingly enough, we don't even know the fellow's name. But he was so dramatically changed that I will tell you this, as a result of what God did in his life, we're in chapter 3 of Acts. If you go on to chapter 4 later on your own time, you'll find out that through his testimony, 5,000 men come to saving faith because of one guy's changed life. Now, I'm going to tell you that this morning, Jose was trying to put up my title up here. I don't normally have lengthy titles like this, okay? I read this passage of scripture years ago. I thought, I have got to preach on this sometime. And normally the way we do it is, you know, most of us preachers will study the passage, we'll compare other scripture, I'll look up the meaning of key words in the Bible. Um, eventually I'll put an outline together. The last thing that I ever do is to come up with a title, okay? But I had a title for this message years before I even put the message together. I call what we're about to read the high step in Howley a shout in hitherto handicapped Hebrew. <laughs> Where did you come up with a title like that? Hey, if you want to take notes, just call it the high step in Hebrew, okay? You'll see in our text this morning. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 1 down to verse 10. If you just follow there, I'll read it, and then I'm going to explain it to you. Acts 3, 1 through 10. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. A certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Peter, fasting his eyes upon him, but John said, Look on us. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with him into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the, all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which shot for alms the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. But they noticed the expression, he's walking, leaping, and praising God. That's where I came up with the idea of high step and pounding and shot and pivot through handicap Hebrew. What happened to him? God changed his life. And what God did with him physically is a picture of a much more important event that needs to happen in your life. It is a spiritual transformation. Now, let me break it down with you this way. There are four areas I want to look at. Number one is what I'm calling the routine of religious devotion. Go back to verse one for a minute. Now, Peter and John. Okay, Peter and John. Your memory might probably pull up some connection there. What was their uh, occupation? What were they known as? Yeah, they'd been fishermen. Okay. And then what did they become? Apostles. Apostles. They went from fishermen to fisher of men. Okay, fishers of men. They're apostles. They're disciples of Jesus. So Peter and John went together to the temple. It's the hour of prayer. Interesting. You sing that song, Sweet Hour of Prayer. They literally would spend an hour with God each day in prayer. Mm. Now listen, I'm not telling you if you don't spend an hour with God, you're you're uh, missing out, and you're you know you're going to amount to nothing. But I'm going to tell you, you got to spend some time with God, and you'll never spend an hour with God if you don't start spending some time with Him. Once your time of prayer, interesting. This this was the ninth hour. Let me tell you how they they numbered. They didn't have watches, obviously. They didn't have clock like we did. They had sundials, but. When the sun would come up, that would be hour one, okay? From first hour, it would be about six o'clock in the morning. So if you go nine hours from then, that will put you about three o'clock in the afternoon. What are you doing at three o'clock in the afternoon? Some of you picking up kids from school. Some of you popping up in a five-hour energy or getting your Starbucks so you can try to make it through the day, right? You know what they're doing? They're going to the temple to spend time with God in prayer. I call it the routine of religious devotion. The two things you'll notice about anybody that God ever uses powerfully. In Acts chapter 6, verse 4, you read this of the apostles. They said, we will give ourselves continually to prayer, 
and the ministry of the word. We'll give ourselves. That's an interesting term, give ourselves. That's a term of addiction. We've got a lot of churches today with addiction ministries, helping people that have been addicted. What are, what are people often addicted to nowadays? Alcohol, drugs, pornography. Okay, those are bad addictions. You know, you should have some good addictions. You know what you ought to addict yourself to? What the apostles did. They addicted themselves to the Word of God and prayer. I found this, that anybody God ever uses mightily, you can mark it down. They have a consistent time in the Word of God. They study the Bible, they read the Bible, and they pray. You ever read any Christian biographies? And I've read countless biographies. So they'll challenge your faith. I recently was reading the life story of Hudson Taylor, one of my favorites. I've read George Mueller and William Borden and the Wesley Brothers and, you know, uh, Char- uh, uh, sorry, D.L. Moody, uh, Amy Carmichael, Mary Slesser. I've, I've read all kinds of biographies, and I've noticed this. Anybody who ever made an impact in this world, you can mark it down. They had a daily time that they spent in the Word and in prayer. So that begs the question, do you? You might jot this down. Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3 said this about the godly man. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, if he meditate day and night, he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit. This season, his leaf also shall not wither. What's where we do it? Shall prosper. In fact, in 1 Timothy 2, Paul wrote this. I will, therefore, that first of all, prayers, supplications, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then he goes on to say in verse 4, because he will have all men to be saved Amen. and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So why does he want you to pray for people? Well, partly so they'll get saved. How many of you know you got saved because somebody prayed for you? Anybody Amen. know that? Okay, so let me turn that around. Who might be in heaven someday because you care to take time every day to pray for them? Amen. One of the reasons Holly Ham had an impact on my life and still does is every day he's in the Word and prayer. God impressed me as a kid. If I'm going to have an impact on people, I've got to be in the Word and prayer every day. I want to tell you, I promised God when I was a ninth grader at Gloucester County Christian that I would never go to bed at the end of the day if I hadn't spent some time reading the Bible that day. Now, that was when I was 15 years old. I am now 56 years old. 41 years have gone by. By God's grace, I've never missed a day reading my Bible in 41 years. Now, I'm not saying that to brag to them. I read the Bible. You know what else I've done every day for the last 40 plus years? I, I brush my teeth every day. Okay? I, I get a shower or a bath every day. Like, I shave every day. Even when we go on men's wilderness, I take my razor out. I just, I don't know, it's not my thing. I, I have some habits I do every day. I'm not telling you I read the Bible to impress you. I'm telling you because I've got to have time with God. Amen. And guess what? You do too. Remember he said, give us this day our what? Daily bread. We're all looking forward to the meal afterward, because even if you had breakfast this morning, you're thinking about the next meal, right? Okay, how often did God make us to need food? Daily. Okay, that's talking about the food we'll have later. Give us this day our daily bread. But remember, the same Lord said this, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If you need that meal later, every day, you need spiritual food every day. Amen. Not just Sunday. So the routine of religious devotion. Peter and John go to the temple, and they're going there to pray. Interesting, but the focus now moves away from Peter and John to this unnamed man. So I want you to see number two. What I'm calling the rigors of a ruinous disease. Now, this is kind of a wordy outline today. I apologize, but I just saw these pictures in the Bible. Oh, this is too good to mess up. Something rigorous is really tough. My mom, for years, was a member at Campus Church in Pensacola, Florida. And Pastor Jim Scheller was our pastor when I, when I was a student there. And I remember I visited my parents in church, and there were two people that sat across the aisle from us, both in wheelchairs. One was my friend Judy. She grew up in Jersey. She was from the Parsippany area. And Judy got in a car accident when she, after college. And she, she told me, Rich, I was running from God, and God had to get my attention. She went under a semi-truck. It took the top of her car off and caused paralysis. And she's in a wheelchair. And that every time I'm in church, unless she's sick, Judy's there. Sitting a few rows behind her in a fully motorized, fully equipped wheelchair was Alan. And Alan has, is a quadriplegic. In fact, his wheelchair has to do the breathing for Alan. When you're sitting in church, you'll hear... 
it's forcing air through that wheelchair. Alan has just enough uh, motion in one hand that he can use a joystick to operate that wheelchair. You know what impressed me? It didn't matter if it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, they'd be there every time, even when other people were staying home because, oh, I'm kind of tired today. It's tough to battle a handicap like that. And yet, here's this guy. We talk about the rigors of a ruinous disease. This, this disease had taken his life. So pick up there in verse 2. A certain man, laying from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. So back then, they didn't have motorized wheelchairs. They didn't have simple man-operated wheelchair. You, you, how'd you get around? They might have a basic crutch. In this case, the guy couldn't even move. So his family would carry him. Remember those people that dropped the, the guy down to Jesus through the roof? Be like that. They carry him on a tarpaulin, a tarp, and they plop him down. And every day he'd be there, and I hate to go out of the vision of the camera here, but just for a minute, imagine him sitting there and saying, alms, alms to the poor. Okay, so he's begging money because he can't work. There's no government program. There's no charity back then. So he's just begging, alms to the poor. Alms is charitable gifts, right? Okay, so what do we learn from this guy? Well, I wrote, first of all, he was lame from birth. He was lame from birth. This was, we call it congenital. It happened in the womb. He had never been able to walk. One leg he got thrown from a horse or he'd run over by a chariot. He, no, it was not an accident. He was born that way. What a picture. The scripture says, Behold, I was shapen, formed in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's some, um, Psalm 51, verse 5. Shaped in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive. It doesn't mean the act of conception was sick. It means I was born with a sin nature. Right. Have you noticed you don't have to teach babies, you don't have to teach toddlers to do wrong? Amen. They intuitively know it. Right. Then what came over this kid? Uh, well, it's sin, and you got it too. We all have it from the womb. And by the way, my wife loves to remind me that the sin nature was passed through the Father. That is true. It does come <laughs> through the genetic side. Uh, Psalm, I'm sorry, Romans 5.12 says, As by one man, sin entered the world, death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that how many have sinned? All, all have sinned. sinned. I remind her, you got it too, honey. But you know, and by the way, that's why the virgin birth is such an essential doctrine. Jesus was completely human. His mother Mary, a human being, was fully human. But his father wasn't Joseph. His father was God. There was no sin nature passed on to Jesus. He's the sinless one. He is the God man. And uh, another message for another time. So here, this man has a problem from birth. In fact, uh, Psalm 58.3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. You know when I started doing wrong? From the time I was born. Like, oh, I think people are basically good. You know why I think people are basically good? God made us in His image. And so we do have morals. We have a conscience. But the problem is, God's image made in us, we were completely corrupted by sin. Right? I grew up in a church where they taught a false doctrine. The false doctrine was the universal fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man. Now let me tell you, God is everyone's creator, but God is not everyone's father. Amen. Jesus said to the Jews of his days, religious Jews, God's chosen people, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Jesus was a Jew, right? Why did he say that to him? Because all human beings are separated from God by sin. Your parentage does not get you to heaven. The book of John says we're born not of blood, nor of the will of man, nor of the will of flesh, but of God, as many as received Him, Jesus Christ, to then give He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Amen. If That's John 1.12. If you haven't put your trust in Jesus Christ, then you've not been saved by Jesus Christ. You're created by God, and I truly believe that all people are precious to God. All people are made equal by God. That's true. true. But not all people are children of God. Amen. You only become a child of God through Jesus Christ. And who does he want to be saved? He will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants you to be his child. But you know, if I, if I just started living in your house and said, I'm here, well, just my decision to move into your house does not make me part of the family. <laughs> to agree with that couple this week, they, they, bought, they bought a brand new house, and this homeless couple moved in, and they can't get them to leave? Man, what a whacked out society that defends the homeless right to just move in and take over somebody else's house. Just because you move into a house doesn't mean that you're part of the family. How do you become part of a family? Well, there are three legal ways to be part of a family. 
You are born into it, you are adopted into it, or you're married into it. Right. Interesting, the Bible uses all those analogies. Yeah. And as we were going door to door yesterday, I was using this phrase again and again. I said, folks, listen, the reason God sent Jesus into this world was not to start up a religion. At its core, Christianity is not religion, it's a relationship with Christ. Right. And you need to enter a relationship with Him, just like those pictures, birth, adoption, marriage, those are pictures of coming into a relationship with God. You must be born again. So this man was lame from birth. You and I have a sin problem. From birth, we are sinners. But then I want you to see he was left to beg. He was left to beg. That's not on the notes up there. But he's sitting there every day, alms, alms for the poor. Why is he begging? Because he can't do anything for himself. Reminds me of the scripture, Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. Oh, everyone, first thing, come into the waters. He that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. How does a person with no money come buy and eat? Happens in my world a lot. I get taken out to eat by people. They'll say, hey, you want to go out? Well, sure. And I'll go to the restaurant, and I won't pay a dime. I'll walk out of there, and I'm not in jail. Well, I'm not stealing. Somebody else paid the bill. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that can provide for you the bread of heaven. Yeah, that's right. And so he was left to beg. Interesting, Paul the Apostle said, I, I know that in me, that's in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will, to want to do right, is present with me. But how to perform that which is good? I find not. That's in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. I don't know how to do right. I don't have the capacity to do right myself. So that's why you've got to be born again. Amen. I've wondered, as this man is sitting there and he's watching people go by every day, you know, um, maybe he sees a dad and his son and they're on the way to the temple. And the dad may be a tall guy and the son, a little kid. And you know, the kid's like, and the man is taking these full strides and the dad and the boy are staying in step. Maybe the guy sitting there begging thinks, you know, I've got these legs and I've got feet, but I can't even take one step. And look at that little boy. He just motors along. Maybe he sees a mom and her daughter on the way to the marketplace. And you know how little girls do. I'm a dad of all girls. i got three daughters, right? And this little girl's hugging her mom, and she's just, you know, she's doing these little pirouettes. Don't even think about it. And the man thinks, even if I concentrate, I can't even wiggle one toe. Look at that little girl just motor along. I wonder sometimes if people come to church and they might say, Oh, look at that family sitting together. That man's got his arm around his wife. They both have wedding rings, and those rings weren't bought yesterday. It looks like they've been married a while. And judging by the kids in that pew with them, they all look like them. They've got to be their kids. And obviously, they've been married a while. And it looks like he loves that woman. It looks like she loves him. Man, I'm on my second or third marriage, and I haven't been able to make one of them go. I wonder how they pull that off. Have you ever wondered what people think when they're in church? You know, we don't make family work because we're really good, exceptional people. Family works because we have a gracious God. And he yeah, right. can make yeah. all things new. Yeah. He's sitting there and he's watching. And, oh, I would love if I had video footage of this. You ever seen, you know, reenactments of the Bible? I, I love to watch them. And I, I thought, man, there would be something to have actual video footage of this. And if we did, I'd love to have a zoom in on the man's face. Because I want you to see he was left to beg... He was lame from birth, but I want you to see one more thing. He was looking expectantly. If you pick up with me there in verse number uh, 5, Peter, fa I'm sorry, verse 4, Peter fasting his eyes upon him with John said, look at us, and notice these words. He gave heed to them, expecting to receive something of them. Okay, if the camera were to zoom in on this experience, Peter says, hey, look at me, buddy. Oh, can you imagine the face, the facial expression? Oh, this is going to be good. Like, I don't know what he's going to give me, but obviously he's not just throwing a few coins on my little cloth here that I'll gather up at the end of the day. This, is, this must be some serious donation. The way Peter said, look at us. You know, that reminded me of Psalm 145, verse 15. says, the eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. The eyes of all wait upon thee. Who's thee? God. Okay, so how many of you own a dog? Anybody own a dog? Okay, how many of you, when it's feeding time, you have your dog's full attention? Okay, the dog hears the bag being opened or the can being opened, and all of a sudden, the head cocks the ears tune in. Okay, because the dog does not have the wherewithal to open the fridge. Well, some of you do, but some of yours do. But you have not have wherewithal to open the fridge or open the can. The dog is dependent upon you for providing the food. That's the picture of the eyes of all wait upon thee. And thou, you, Lord, 
give them meat and give them their food in due season. Listen, you and I know the Lord. And I wonder when we pray, are we really expecting God to answer? The Lord said, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. He said that. And we know him. And yet I think this total stranger to Peter has more expectancy to receive something from Peter than many of God's own children do when it comes to God, who's made us faithful promises and proven himself with precedent time and time again. So he's looking expectantly. Okay, so those are the rigors of a ruinous disease. But number three, and this is in verses six and seven, I want you to see what I'm calling the raising of a ruined cripple. Now, by the way, I don't mean cruelty by the way I'm painting the picture ruined, crippled. Well, that would have been the way he would have described his life. Like, I can't walk, I can't work, I can't do anything. But God. Amen. So notice this. When Peter says, look at us. Now pick up in verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, the master of rise and the walk. He took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. All right, now here I'd like to go back to the video clip and imagine this. So he just said, look at us. And the man said, yeah. And he says, look, buddy, I don't have any money. So we're going to go out. Typical preacher, right? Sorry, can't help you there. Like, what do you think his face looks like now? He just told me to look at you, and now you got nothing? But in the next breath, he says, but what I do have, I'm going to give you. Amen. And he reaches down. In the name of Jesus Christ, the master, rise up and walk. Now what do you think the facial expression looks like? He is standing for the first time in his life. He's never been able to stand. What a picture of salvation. I want to tell you something. You and I have no standing before God until God gives us that standing. You see, people spend a lifetime trying to get right with God, trying to be good enough to go to heaven. I was talking to one of you yesterday, and you were telling me, yeah, I grew up in church where, you know, I... I asked the priest, how good do you have to be to go to heaven? He said, you just keep working at it. You just keep, you know, just keep doing as good as you can. Well, how good is good enough? I want you to think of this. You know, what if growing up every week you put money in the offering at church? Every week you put a little bit of money in, and then one day you and your buddies go out and you rob a convenience store. You know, now back then there was no Wawa. You go into Heritage's back then, you know, and you rob a Heritage's, and all of a sudden there's a pursuit, and you get caught, and you're arrested, and you're going to be sentenced to jail. You would not think of saying, I gave money to the church offering every week. I'm a good person. You're not getting arrested because you didn't get enough money in the church offering. You're getting arrested because you stole. Listen to this. The Bible says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. James 2, verse 10. Amen. You and I are not ultimately going to miss heaven because we didn't do enough good. No, no. The Bible says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's Isaiah 64, 6. Your iniquity is like the wind of taking you away. Your good deeds will never get you to heaven. See, you're guilty before God. I'm guilty before God. Let me tell you why I preach this passionately. Well, first, because I know it's the truth. It's God's truth. Amen. Also, because I know if it weren't for the salvation of Jesus Christ... I personally would be heading to hell the moment I die. I know that to be true. Amen. Because God is righteous, He is perfectly, absolutely holy, and I have offended God. I have sinned against God. Somebody wisely said, for righteousness to be righteous, it has to originate with God. For righteousness to be righteous, it has to originate with God. The scripture says it this way, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Okay, he who knew no sin, that's Jesus, became sin for us. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And here's the picture. It's like you had this multi-million dollar debt against God. There's no way you can pay it off. And like Jesus comes... And pays off the debt. Amen. But if that were the picture, that were the picture stopped, that would put you at a zero balance. Okay, now you have no debt. He didn't just pay off your debt. He put in your account his righteousness. Amen. That puts you in the plus column to the multi-millions, as it were. God sees you justified, just as if you'd never sinned, just as if you were Jesus Christ. So when Peter says, Look at us, the man hasn't ever been able to stand for. Instantly he's standing. 
When you come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, instantly you have standing before God. That's right. You're justified by Jesus Christ. So, all of a sudden the man is standing. What do you think his face looks like now? Wow. I wrote down Ephesians 2.13. You have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Quickened. What does that mean? Animated. Made alive. Energized. You know, uh, some people say, oh, you know, you made him alive. You can be on life support and be alive. But it's not very energetic, Right? The word quicken speaks of vitality and vibrancy and life. You, he energized, he quickened, he made a life. Let me explain something. Salvation is not bad people suddenly trying to become good people. No, salvation isn't bad people simply becoming good people. Salvation is dead people being made alive. Yeah. That's what the new, it's called the new birth. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus used the term, you must be born again. You're like, oh, born again. What does that mean? Well, you better find out. Because Jesus was the one who said it. And he told us this. Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You won't get to heaven without being born again. So you say, well, I don't know what that means. Well, let's talk about it. (laughs) You don't get born again through a church. You get born again through Jesus Christ. And you need him as your Savior. And I would plead with you during our invitation time. Let us sit down and show you how to be saved. You don't get to heaven joining Living Water Bible Church. You get to heaven by getting the Living Water, who is Jesus Christ. But we're here to tell you about it. So, he was all of a sudden raised up, the raising of a ruined cripple. But finally, I want you to see in verses 8 to 10, the response of a regenerated man. The response of a regenerated man. I thought about this. So he's standing there. He's never been able to stand for Interest, Interesting that it says immediately, right away, his feet and ankle bones receive strength. It wasn't like, you know, when your toddler learned to walk. You remember saying, come to, come to mama, baby. And the child walks and boom, they fall on their face. Or, it's a good thing we didn't learn to walk as adults. We'd all be in the hospital, right? <laughs> this man, the first time he's on his feet, he has perfect agility. It's, it's like watching a big man die on his feet, you know, if you can relate to that analogy. He just has perfect smoothness, perfect balance. I'm, I'm tall, 6'6". Six, six. I've always had trouble with balance. You know, in sports, you got to have good balance or everything's off. In your spiritual life, you got to have good balance. That can only come from God. you got to have good standing. That can only come from God. Yeah. And immediately, feet and ankle bones receive strength. Okay, so what do you read? Verse 8. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple. He had never been able to go into the temple. Uh, interestingly enough, there were laws against cripples being in the temple, and he couldn't have gone if he wanted to. Okay? So he walks into the temple, and he's walking, he's leaping, and he's praising God, and all the people saw it. I wonder what the conversation was like among the people. Hey! I've been giving money to that guy for years. <laughs> was this all a sham? Is this like those homeless people, you know, and you follow them home and they live in a, you know, several hundred thousand dollar house and they're getting all this money for free, no taxes, and you're like, what a fraud. Somebody says, no, he's not a fraud. I know that guy. I know his family. Right. He wouldn't blow his cover if this were all a fraud. Right. Something happened. Let's go find out. Okay, so I put this. Walking, first of all, is a picture of example in life. Example in life, okay? The, the response of a regenerated man. He became an example in living. He, he's walking. He, he stands up and says, All right, I'm not just staying here. And where's the, interesting, where's the first place he goes? The house of God. Because he now, he, now he can walk. It's not like, Hey, I'm going to the bar. He wants to be in the house of God. What an interesting change in this man. So he heads to the, to the house of the Lord. And in the Bible, walking is a picture of the Christian life. Uh, Romans 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. February 12th of 1977, I was just a kid. I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. When I was born again, my dad walked me through the book of John, chapter 3. And that day I trusted the Lord, put my dependence on Christ to save me. And I had a whole new walk. He totally changed me. Because now, no condemnation to me. I'm in Christ Jesus. Okay, I also jotted down Romans uh, 84. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. You walk, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Galatians uh, 5.16 says this. I say then, walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
And Colossians 2, 6 says, As you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. So what's walking a picture of? Your lifestyle, your conduct, your testimony. Okay, so he's an example in life. I had gone back to Gloucester County Christian to speak in chapel one year. I was an evangelist. And I told the teenagers, listen, I wasn't a kid that grew up in a Bible preaching church. I wasn't a kid that went to Sunday school. I wasn't a kid that knew all these Bible characters. And so I got a late start. I, I grew up at Sewell Elementary School, went to Clearview Junior High. Um, I got introduced to heavy metal when I was a kid. I was into bands like ACDC, Van Halen, Led Zeppelin, all this stuff. And so I've been saved at age 10, but I didn't have any disciples. I didn't know, how do I, what do I do now? How do I grow? And so I started going to a Bible preaching church, and the youth group kids said, so what kind of music do you listen to? And I told them, they said, don't you know that's bad? I didn't, I didn't think of it being good or bad. I just like the music, right? And then I began to realize, hey, my musicians are telling me that they're singing about sex, drugs, and rebellion. You know, it's not the preacher's opinion. They're telling me that, and I knew it. My, my friend in the church said, yeah, you shouldn't listen to that. You should listen to this. And so they started challenging me. Well, I totally changed. I, I remember the night I burned up all the music. I had a paper route back then, and I used to buy a rock album a week. I had hundreds of dollars of, of LPs, you know, vinyls. And uh, I remember the night I just got rid of it all. Well, I'm telling this story in chapel. I had a kid come up to me. His name was Mike. And he said, hey, Rich, can I talk to you? He said, sure, Mike. He said, I want to give you something. He handed me a keychain from the rock group Kiss. Now, I'm a preacher, okay? And I looked at that and said, well, Mike, that is one of the more interesting gifts I've ever been given. <laughs> and he said, what are you going to do with it? I said, well, to be truthful, I'm going to destroy it. He said, that's what I want you to do with it. Yeah. Amen. I said, okay, you got to tell me why. He said, look, I live in Denver. He said, all my music's at home. He said, I, I got MP3 loaded with all that stuff. He said, when I go home, I'm dumping it all. I'm getting rid of it. I'm destroying it. And this is my token to you that I'm getting rid of all that. Yeah, I said, well, hey, Mike, first of all, I'm good. I'm glad. But I want, I want to tell you something. If you just do this off the emotion of a chapel, in a week you'll be back to this stuff. So it's got to, you've got to be rooted in Bible principle. He's like, no, no. It's not just you that's been talking to me about it. God's been working on me for a long time. He said, like, this summer, I got a friend who lives across the street. I think the friend's name was Sam. He said, across from my house in Denver, I got this friend, and I've been praying, God, please let me talk to Sam. Please let Sam get saved. He said, one day, Sam is sitting on his porch. Nobody's around. I'm like, perfect. So he said, I got my Bible. I got some tracks from church. I went over and I plopped down next to him. I said, Sam, can I talk to you about some things I'm learning in church? He's like, okay. So he said, I started going through the Romans road. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. I'm going through the plan. All of a sudden he stops and says, hey, time out, mate. Sam, what's up? He said, save your breath, dude. He said, what do you mean? He said, Go out there and preach this to the heathen, man. He said, I'm on your team. He said, no, no, Mike, don't, uh, Sam, don't you understand you're a sinner? He said, I'm not a sinner. He said, what about all this? Like, he said, dude, I've been over to your house. I've seen the movies you guys watch. I've looked through the music that you listen to. Dude, I've seen the girls you sneak over this house when your mom and dad ain't home. Man, we like the same kind of women, dude. Don't worry about me. I'm on your team. Go out there and preach this to the sinners, man. And Mike dropped his head. He said, you know what, Rich? I couldn't convince him that he needed the Lord because he didn't see any difference between him and Ray. Right, right, right. He said, I'm done with that kind of life. Praise the Lord. I want to get serious about God. That's pretty convicting, isn't it? Yeah. Example in life. All of a sudden, this guy's walking. It's not like he's going to church like, you know, he's drunk. He's walking with perfect ability. Where'd that come from? God. He said, well, I don't, I don't have enough willpower to become a Christian. You're absolutely right. You cannot become a Christian by your own will. Right. You can only become a Christian by the enabling of God. But I want to tell you something. He will give you perfect standing when you come to Jesus Christ for salvation. So he's walking. as an example in life. But then he's leaping. Okay, now let me act this out. So all of a sudden, you guys want Church, but that's what the Bible says, okay? I'm telling you what it says. He's leaping. He's praising God. Well, think about it. 
I mean, the man could never walk, and all of a sudden he could walk. That's just the ability to go from paralyzed to perfectly sound. What about you? You've got eternal forgiveness of sins. You've got a relationship with God. Amen. Don't you think there ought to be some exuberance about it? Amen. So I call this exuberance of spirit. Okay, there's an example in life, and then the leaping picture is exuberance of spirit. Listen to these scriptures. Ecclesiastes 9 10 says, What sort of thy hand find it to do? Do it with thy might. Do it with, with enthusiasm, with gusto. Um, Romans chapter 12, verse 11 tells us to be not slothful in, bu- in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Okay, like slothful. What's the root of the word slothful? Sloth. You know what sloths do all day? Nothing. They get high in eucalyptus. That's what they do all day. The sloths sleep about 23 plus hours a day. The rest of the time they're eating eucalyptus leaves. And they are. there's a picture of the drug crowd for you. What, what's being the problem? These guys are strung out on their eucalyptus and they're asleep for 23 hours and they're accomplishing. And God says, you don't be slothful. No. Okay, well, I work hard, brother. But he says, be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Do people see enthusiasm about you for the Lord? You know, one of the things that drew me to Holly Ham as my mentor and coach was his enthusiasm for God. The man loved God. I sat under Brother Jim Shetler as a pastor down at, at PCC, and I don't know if you ever heard Brother Shetler preach, but he's like, it's unbelievable. I just call my life really. He preaches like this, and, and he lives like that. that. That draws you to that kind of person. Amen. It's not fake. They're real, but they're the real deal for God. I wonder who's drawn to God by your genuine enthusiasm for him. Let me tell you about Jesus. I love him. Hmm. I want to give you one more. There's example in life. There's exuberance of spirit. But then there's exaltation of God. Notice he's walking, leaping, and doing what? Praising God. God has delivered me. In fact, going down to verse 10, they knew that it was he which sat for all the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at that which happened unto him. He's praising God. He's telling them what happened. This crowd gathers. I'd love, if you had time, take some time, to read the rest of chapter 3. Go into chapter 4. You'll find out that this creates such a stir in the temple. A huge crowd gathers. Peter says, look, it's not our power to heal this guy. It's Jesus Christ that you people recently crucified. Yeah, the one God raised from the dead. Through him, there's salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's right. And 5,000 men come to saving faith. Amen. Incredible. Through one guy's testimony. Praising God. You know, I thought about it. Why do we put steeples on churches? They don't increase your heating and air conditioning ability. They don't give extra storage space. They're totally symbolic. When you look at a, a steeple, which way are your eyes directed? Uh, up. And on the top of a lot of Bible preaching churches, what do you find affixed to the top of the steeple? A cross. The way to heaven is through the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. It's a symbol. Okay, praising God. What does God do? Uh, everything for you. In Him we live and move and have our being. So I thought of Hebrews 13, 15. This is a powerful scripture. Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise continually, uh, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. I thought, man, how can praise be a sacrifice? Well, when it comes to testimony time in church, the pastor always says, okay, who's got a testimony? Who will be first? Dead silence. Okay, who will be second? You know, nobody wants to be first, so... Scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Man, when you've got when something's happening, you want to testify. I appreciate right. Steve getting up saying, God's been working in my heart through the Word of God this week. I want to tell about it. Yeah. This worship's not about how do I feel, it's about exalting God, praising God. Amen. So this man is telling everybody, it's God who did this. How can praise be a sacrifice? Well, one, if you're not comfortable speaking, but you do anyway, that's a sacrifice. Yeah. Maybe you say, I'm not a very good singer, so I just sit here. Sacrifice of praise. You praise God even if you don't feel comfortable singing. You know, you ought to be good to sing in church. You ought to be good to sing in the choir. You don't have to be good to sing congregationally. Sing anyway. God loves to hear you sing. Amen. He inhabits the praise of his people. How about at the workplace you sing? I'll tell you, God's been good. This is what you say. You got a Bible thumper? You know, you say God's been good at church. That's normal. At the workplace? That's the sacrifice. Amen. Amen. By the way, you have a day like Paul and Silas where they got beaten for... Uh, freeing a girl from demon possession and then preaching the gospel, 
And at midnight, they not only prayed, they sang praises to God. Right. Man. In the worst of circumstances, they're praising God. That's the sacrifice of praise. Walking, leaping, praising God. Anybody can praise God when you just got a bonus. Anybody can praise God when you just got healed. Right. Can you praise God when things are terrible? Right. Paul did. You. Amen. So I call him the high step and how you shot and hitherto many that fever. Let me tell you something. The transformed life in this man drew others to Jesus Christ. I mentioned Mr. Ham. He's one man that God used in my life. My dad, totally changed by the gospel. My dad made an impact on me because of a transformed life. I wonder, whose life are you impacting? Whose life are you influencing? Oh, I'm not influencing any. Oh, let me tell you, you're influencing somebody. They watch you. And I want to ask this. Somebody had said you know, not everybody will read a book of the Bible. Not everybody will read a gospel passage. But you're writing a gospel, a chapter each day. Take care the writing is true, for you're the only gospel some men will read, the gospel according to you. What are people seeing in your life? Let's bow our hands. This is great. Thank you. Lord, what a lesson from this man who was a cripple, and all of a sudden he's running everywhere, telling people about Jesus. Couldn't have done it by his own determination. Couldn't have done it by willpower. Had to happen through God's power. Help us to see we'll never get saved by our own power. We'll never make ourselves right before you. That's why Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. He came to justify the sinner, to give life to the dead person, make us alive in him. I pray for any of you who don't know you yet. We think it crystal clear that they need you. Those who are sitting in this auditorium, or those listening by way of live stream, please work in the hearts of people hearing this message. And then for Christians, what a picture of walking, leaping, praising God. Example in life, the exuberance of spirit, exaltation of God. There's a lot for us in what we've just heard. Please challenge us in these areas. Now, to answer that, I'll ask you this. How many of you can say, you know, there came a time in my life that I understood that I'm a rotten sinner? And I trusted Jesus Christ to be my Savior. And I can, I can attest to this. I had no life, and now I have forever life. The Lord is my Savior. Would you lift your hand if you know that to be true? And you said, thank God, I know it. Amen. Many hands. Or you might put them down. Some of you might be thinking right now, I don't like my preachers to do that. It's kind of personal. Okay, let me say this kindly to you. If you think it's uncomfortable for a preacher to ask you where you stand with God, what do you suppose is going to happen on the day of judgment when you actually meet God for a It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. I don't tell you this for the purpose of making you feel uncomfortable. I tell you this because the Bible says, prepare. Prepare to meet thy God. Well, I'm trying, but I can never be good enough. Oh, that's exactly right. You'll never be good enough. That's why you need to be saved. You don't get to heaven through the church. You get to heaven through Christ. If your church can save you, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Your church can't save you. My church can't save me. Only Jesus can save you. Now, church is important, vitally important. It doesn't save you. It's where you get equipped and where you grow and where you have uh, family time. But only Jesus can save you. Is there anybody this morning? You'd be very honest to admit, Rich. I don't know. I do not know with certainty that I would be in heaven when I die. I do not know that God has forgiven me of my sins. I feel convicted about that. I sense a need. I do want to come to God for forgiveness. I do want to be saved. Would you let me know? You said that is my desire. Would you hold up your hand? I won't embarrass you. Yes. Just a couple of different people. Okay, you may put them down. That's yes. at least three different people. Maybe you said, well, I, I would never admit that. It's not for my purpose. Yeah. We're doing this. It's for your sake. We need the Lord. Let me explain to you. Right there where you're seated, you could call on the Lord. Amen. What's necessary? I'll repent. That means realize you're a guilty sinner before a holy God. <coughs> You're not good. You're guilty. Me too. Well, I'm not that bad. No, not that bad. That'll get you to heaven. God's holy, perfect, and righteous. 
Remember when they wouldn't let people in the hospital because COVID would cause other people to be contaminated, right? God will not let into heaven anything that would contaminate heaven. He says so in his word. So if you can't go to heaven without being perfect, how can you get to heaven? You've got to be made perfect through Christ Jesus. That's why he died to shed his blood on the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord should be saved. So repent. Now receive Jesus Christ by simple faith. Right there in your pew, you can pray this. God, I am a guilty sinner. I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve your mercy. But I understand believe that Jesus died on that awful cross to pay for my sins. I believe your word. I believe he rose again. And I ask you now, will you please save me based on what Jesus Christ did for me? And with your heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone you'd say, you know, right now, today, I just asked the Lord to save me. And I understood that. Pray for me. I just asked Him to save me. Anybody that like that? Now, maybe there's somebody who said, okay, I'm starting to understand. I would like to receive Him. How about we sit down with you and talk to you, shoulder to shoulder, face to face. And we'll explain it to you. We won't talk in front of everybody. We'll take you to one of the Sunday school rooms where we can sit down in private for five or so minutes. Wherever necessary, explain it to you. Is there someone here you'd say, yes, I would like to have a conversation and I would like to ask the Lord to be my Savior. I would like that to happen. Would you hold your hand back up? You say, I would like that. I would like that. Okay? I'm going to invite you in a moment to respond. In fact, let me ask this of everyone. Would you all look at me? Would you stand with me as we close this service today? I want you to stand. Let me explain why I close the service the way I'm about to. This is what we call an invitation. It comes from the word invite. I'm inviting a response. If you don't know the Lord as Savior, I'd love you to come and meet the pastor here at the front. And here's what we'll do. We'll have somebody talk to you. If you're a fellow, we'll have one of the guys talk to you. If you're a gal, we'll have one of the ladies talk to you. We'll take you to one of the side rooms here and we'll just sit down in the Bible and say, okay, here's what he was talking about. Here's what Jesus did for you. Would you like to be saved? He said, yes. Folks, listen, you're not joining this church. This is not a religious thing. This is a relationship with God that you need. And that's what we'll explain to you. And I'd love to have you come and let us explain that to you. Now, Christians, here's the invitation for you. Walking. How's your testimony? My friend Mike tried to talk to his buddy and said, I, I don't need to be saved. There's no difference between you and me. Ooh, your walk matters. Amen. How about exuberance of spirit? Anybody convicted of that today? How about exaltation of God? Point, making a point to literally direct praise back to God. I'm going to ask you as a Christian, if God dealt with you through his word, there's room here at the platform, there's room at these pews, you can turn to me. The reason I give an invitation, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It's humbling to respond to God. So, she's playing the piano. Our heads are bowed. Would you come this morning? Now would be the time. We're going right there at your place. Just say, excuse me, and hope to let you out. If you need to be saved, we'll show you how to be saved. And Brother Jose's right here in the front. We can help you. Talk to you that we found the assistant pastor and said, I, I want to know if I can go to heaven. Why somebody talk to you? Okay,